Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and I'd like to thank the actual organizers of the event, not those who are listed as well as the actual organizers, Sean, Michael, and Peter, for bringing us here. Uh, so yes, yeah, so, uh, since this is a tutorial, there will be a pretest <laughs> and a homework. <laughs> Actually, no pretest, but uh, I will be using the Socratic method to answer your questions. Means that I won't actually answer them. All right, so uh, let me tell you, this is a, actually kind of a, I think a rather easy task uh, because I won't be actually talking about my own research. I will be talking about other people's work. Um, so it's both hard and easy at the same time. And if I can get this going, then we'll get going. Uh, but before I start, let me uh, give a, a plug for uh, the UW Quantum X. Uh, so basically it's a university-wide uh, initiative uh, and um, the short statement is here, uh, seeks to facilitate and support activities in, uh, to accelerate quantum discoveries and technologies. This is very broad and very um, vague. Uh, and that's basically roughly where we are right now, but we're trying to organize some educational efforts uh, at the university, as well as hopefully uh, promote some hires uh, in this area. So um, anyway, that's, that's quantum X. Let's go back to ions. So uh, my, uh, my kind of plan today is to um, go over some of the uh, most kind of advanced uh, results uh, in the area of trapped ion quantum computing uh, uh, to basically uh, see where we stand and um, also describe work of some um, existing uh, companies working on building uh, these uh, computers and then just you know spend a few minutes trying to emphasize that there's still many things to be figured out and done in this area. So roughly where we are. So this is trapped ion system. I will not uh, talk about qubits and how they work. You'll hear about it later. Uh, I'll just um, say that basically at the moment, uh, trapped ion quantum computers are, I would say, uh, on par with the other technology uh, that is more popular in the industry. Uh, which we'll hear about later. Um, but uh, so basically, um, some, we're somewhere on the level of 10 uh, uh, of qubits that are fully interconnected. That is, each qubit can talk to uh, uh, another qubit, uh, every other qubit. So that's the, um, the connectivity of the system. Uh, the gate fidelity is rather high. These numbers of many nines um, for many nines for single qubit operations and uh, well, three nines for two qubit, they are uh, actual numbers from experiments. They actually aren't the numbers that you would get from this working 10 or 20 uh, on some days uh, quantum computer. The numbers for that would be lower. So these are the, the, the highest, uh, the best results that can be uh, achieved at the moment. Uh, they come from different labs. So the 99.9% is from NIST, I believe. Uh, the single qubit uh, rotations are from Oxford uh, and also NIST. And then uh, the spam errors, state preparation, preparation and measurement errors, I think that's also the uh, Oxford result. Uh, as far as how many operations can be done on this actually 10 or so qubit quantum computer, the number is about 60, which is actually pretty good, meaning that we can, so th these are 60 uh, two qubit gates that can be done on this machine or more. So why uh, only 60? What happens after 60? Well, the, the, the error rate is such that after that, the, the coherence is basically lost. Um, and so where, you know, the, the, the kinds of um, applications that have been run on, this, uh, on these devices range from simulations of molecules, such as water, uh, to uh, various exotic Hamiltonians, so simulating Hamiltonians. In fact, in terms of simulations, 
the number is uh, of qubits is of order 50, not, not, not 10 uh, for these Hamiltonians. And then some small quantum algorithms can also be run. All right. Uh, in terms of hardware, uh, these uh, systems uh, often use chip traps. Uh, so traps made out of, you know, semiconductor technology. Uh, and sometimes they would be cryogenically cooled to something like uh, a few degrees Kelvin to reduce the heating of the ions. It's not always the case and it's not maybe always necessary yet. Uh, in order to achieve these uh, single qubit gates and uh, two qubit gates, there are uh, single ion addressing um, hardware devices, namely the multi-channel AOMs. Uh, multi-channel PMTs are used for state detection typically in these large systems, large-ish systems. Um, and then as far as the traps themselves, uh, it's either a harmonic trap, so the, it's a linear trap but it, uh, it's, the, its uh, potential can be either harmonic along that uh, weak axis, the linear axis of the trap, and uh, up to 50 ions or so can be held in a chain in that uh, configuration. Uh, you can also deform that potential and make it more uh, of a flat bottom potential, more like particle in the box potential in 1D. Uh, and basically, in these unharmonic traps, uh, maybe hundreds, a hundred ions or so uh, can be stabilized. So it all good, looks fine in terms of numbers. It's actually not that, uh, if you look into the details, it's not that uh, perfect. Uh, but anyway, but uh, another bit of technology is using these interconnected traps. So uh, um, uh, the, the, the so-called <coughs> quantum CCD technology where ions are moved around and uh, are only brought into some uh, you know, interaction region when necessary to get entangled states. So this is a picture. The picture is taken from um, a paper by uh, the IonQ team uh, of uh, their system. And so what we have here is a, a, a trapped ion register. We have our multi-channel AOM that can turn on and off uh, these individual beams um, on demand to enable individual addressing for quantum gates. There's also usually, not usually, but uh, always uh, necessary to have a, a global beam that shines on all the ions, but the, uh, the qubit gates would only happen when two beams are present. Uh, and then uh, ions uh, conveniently shine all their light down through this viewport and into the detectors. Well, anyway, so that's a cartoon. Uh, uh, the number of channels in these uh, AOMs are, is 32, I believe. So that's where one part of uh, kind of, yes, sure. Why do you use the trap to go rather than using the AOMs? Well, Sean, what does a diffractive element do? Sorry, <laughs> I said I would use uh, Socratic. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so actually, I think. Um, uh, so uh, you can you can use multiple. I think yeah, you, you can use multiple ways of splitting the beam into uh, several. And I believe it's just uh, it's it's a convenient and low loss way of generating multiple beams of the same intensity. So I'm, actually, I'm not sure. All right, so that's the kind of the uh, typical setup of one of these advanced devices. So uh, the players are the big players. Um, uh, in terms of universities and labs, we have Maryland Duke conglomerate, so to speak, uh, NIST Boulder, Innsbruck, and actually many, 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 many more, and they keep coming up. Uh, whereas in terms of industry so far, we actually have IMQ, Alpine quantum technology and Honeywell. And basically, as far as I know, that's it. Uh, the list for the superconducting technology companies is bigger and more impressive. But anyway, so where are we, what do we have? So briefly, what do these companies have uh, currently? So I'll start with IonQ. This is their uh, kind of advertisement image. Uh, it's an image of a, uh, a chip trap. It's uh, Sandia HOA2, 
Um, it has multiple electrodes here, which are hard to see. They're connected with wire bonds to a chip carrier. The, so the scale here is roughly one centimeter square for this uh, uh, chip. Uh, and then uh, they're showing uh, a, 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 an image of roughly 50 or so trapped ions. Um, these are trapped in a harmonic trap, which we can tell by spacing uh, being much larger here than in the middle, but it's a, it's a linear chain. Of ions, what do they claim to have? This is the information from their website. Uh, they can do more than 60 uh, two qubit gates, so run a program that's relatively long before decoherence occurs. Uh, the connectivity is fully connected for 11 qubits. At, at least that's their present uh, official uh, number. Uh, they can do up to 55 individual addressable pairs though, so they, have to, they can do more pairs. It's just for the full connectivity that's shown here schematically, they can do 11. Uh, and then the precision is actually not as good as those numbers, not that many nines, but not uh, that bad either. 0.03 for one qubit gate and about 1% for, uh, so these are errors for two qubit gates. All right, so that's, that's the... Um, the ion uh, Q, the AQT, the Innsbruck uh, startup uh, lists uh, in, an image of a relatively old technology. It's a workhorse uh, uh, linear trap at Innsbruck. And so actually personally, I don't uh, have any information about um, their gate fidelities and such that they can achieve. They uh, list the uh, scalable short quantum algorithm and quantum chemistry simulations as things that ha they have uh, accomplished, but no official error budget or anything. So this, you know, this is just a brief uh, overview. And then Honeywell, Honeywell um, has uh, this picture. This is a picture of uh, a different trap from the one that um, IonQ uses. This one has multiple zones uh, and the ions can be shuttled from one zone to another. And in fact, they're pushing for parallel processing. And so to speak, they are able to demonstrate parallel operations in three zones in this trap. So doing uh, two, sorry, three, two qubit gates simultaneously um, on uh, three different pairs of qubits here. And they use shuttling in the so-called quantum CCD architecture, moving uh, ions around. And they perform sympathetic cooling and all everything that was basically listed in that paper by Pilpinski, Monroe, and Weinland outlining the QCCD proposal. No numbers on officially, at least on their uh, errors. All right, speeding up. So uh, challenges, there, there are many. This actually is a quote from uh, uh, an NSF quantum information science scoping review uh, authored by uh, about, I don't know, 50 people. And so the primary challenge here is the systems level engineering of optical controllers and electrode structures uh, to connect group, uh, groups of trapped ions through shuttling, as well as integrating with photonic interconnects. All right, I will add some uh, other challenges that are maybe more technical, but uh, uh, so from what I know about these systems, you know, we see 10 qubits and performing this algorithm and that, it, it all looks great, but uh, technically things are uh, still quite difficult and there are uh, these little things that still make the moving forward to many uh, qubits difficult. So one is crosstalk, both in addressing single ions with these focused laser beams, as well as in things like state detection, uh, where uh, these multi-channel uh, PMTs for the multiplier tubes actually get uh, crosstalk between each other. Um, there are drifts in these traps, drifts of, or systems of various things like laser pointing or uh, uh, stray electric fields and things like micromotion uh, needs to be compensated regularly and by regularly, uh, probably, we probably mean every 15 minutes or so. So if you run this continuously, you have to stop, recalibrate, realign, and then start uh, again. Uh, so uh, how, now, how do we scale from this, maybe let's say 50 ion system to thousands, I'm not sure millions, but 
how do we scale? So uh, in these various types of traps, uh, harmonic traps or unharmonic traps, yes, we can uh, confine 50 or 100 ions, but not all ions are, end up being useful qubits. Uh, so for example, in a non-harmonic trap, the ones in the middle are soft. Uh, their, uh, their axial frequency is actually quite low. So they're not really useful for, uh, not really useful qubits. So you kind of have to, you can't use them. And as you scale it to a larger number, a number of those ions, the, the soft ions increases. And what is the model for scaling? Uh, is it Serac Zoller? Probably no. Is it QCCD or is it the music architecture, which are, I'll show you briefly next, or do we even know that yet? That's the Socratic. Yeah. Sure. Oh. Oh. Uh, Freedom encodes zero and one. So zero and one is uh, either the the hyperfine. Usually it's the hyperfine state. Uh, hyperfine states of the ground state, but sometimes it's optical. So it could be ground state and a metastable excited state. Uh, it could also be Zeeman. So some some pair of uh, levels. Yeah. Yeah, so I, yeah, I don't have time to talk about uh, those uh, details. All right, so um, actually, in the interest of time, very quickly, this is the, uh, the music architecture, modular universal scalable trap ion quantum computer. Uh, the idea is to scale up not by adding more ions to the same trap or by shuttling ions from uh, one zone to another, but rather having multiple uh, small uh, elementary logic unit devices with maybe a few tens of ions which we can control and confine and then uh, scale by uh, linking them through photonic interconnect through photons rather than local interactions between ions um, or maybe and you'll hear a little bit more about that in the next talk uh, we can scale up by using more dimensions that we have in our space. More than uh, one dimension, so going from linear trap to uh, two-dimensional flat uh, trap may be another way of scaling. Uh, and this is a picture from our lab, so I do get to show our own work. All right, thank you. And okay, time for questions. Yeah. So uh, I think in the in in the uh, um, those fluxon sub subconducting qubit uh, context, people like I think IBM and other companies um, when they uh, create those network, the, one of the crucial issue is the connectivity. That so I guess it will be a similar issue in the ion trap. Uh, how crucial it is it for a qubit sitting at A, point A, to talk to a very distant qubit at B. And um, I mean, this is probably also related to scalability that you talk about. Right, sure. So yeah. uh, how crucial it is, uh, I wouldn't say it's absolutely necessary. It's nice to have inter full interconnectivity. And at the present scale, we do have that uh, qubit, qubit uh, A can talk to B, C, D, E, F, G, I, J. Um, yeah, so all of them. Um, if that's not the case, if it can only talk to the nearest neighbors, for example, we can, and, but uh, if that can be done on the short time scale, say we can do very quick gates that are nearest neighbor gates, uh, then that may be uh, enough and it may be just fine for scaling. We just would have to adjust our algorithms, our optimization procedure from, you know, going from the the Hamiltonian or the unitary that we're trying to simulate, right, to the gates, keeping that in mind, yeah, optimized. So yeah, uh, I don't think it's absolutely necessary. Further questions? Well, I've got one. Um, so given the uh, technology that we have today with tens of qubits, you mentioned quantum chemistry. Like how big of a, of a molecule or which problems can one tackle with the technology that's available today? Okay, uh, um, good question. I don't actually know the 
complete answer to that. I know the uh, IMQ uh, device was able to simulate water molecule okay. with very good precision. So that was using 11 qubits. Um, so yeah, I mean, I don't know how it actually depends on how many degrees of freedom you have to simulate for the molecule. And I'm mm -hmm. not a molecular physicist. Sorry. If you can uh, speculate, okay. you know, in the future, do you see any differentiation between the superconducting qubits and the ion qubits where one maybe might be used for some computing and others for others, or is it totally open? Um, there will be only one winner. Uh, no, uh, I'm not, uh, yeah, so uh, it's possible, yeah, yeah. It's, it's like, like I, said, I, I, I don't know, we don't know exactly how the two uh, will develop and at what mm -hmm. rate uh, the, the uh, development will happen. Uh, it may, so actually one thing I forgot to mention and I should have is that uh, there's no even mentioning of error correction yet, quantum error correction, we're doing any, everything we, we can with given the errors. So uh, at, at least currently the error uh, rate in the superconducting devices is quite a bit higher than in qubits. So uh, they may be more suitable for things like simulations uh, that require larger, right, right now the systems are a bit larger, so larger systems. Uh, but again, this is near term, you know, who knows in, in a couple of years where we'll stand. Mm -hmm. All right. Any further questions? All right, thank you very much for all this insight. And our next speaker is Jennifer Liliholm, also from UDAP, and she's talking on trapped ion quantum computing research at UDAP. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Jennifer Lilliholm from Boris's Trapped Ion Quantum Computing Group at UW, and I'll be here talking about our research. All right. Uh, so first, I've got a brief introduction on ion traps for you, um, followed by my experiment looking at quantum jumps in a parabolic mirror ion trap. We've also started a project looking at remote entanglement between a single trapped ion and a zinc oxide donor defect qubit. Uh, my lab mate Ludmila is here and gave a poster presentation yesterday on her work with efficient, super, efficient sympathetic cooling of mixed species ion chains. And then we also have a 2D trap which has been recently, collect, recently built and is looking at characterizing 2D ion crystals. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> Okay, so the basic ion trap consists of an RF ring and two end cap electrodes. This ring oscillates between positive and negative charge, which then alternates a pushing and pulling force on the ion. Over time, this gives us a time average stable minimum to the electric field where the ion can be caught. The two end cap electrodes contain the ion axially. So when you're doing experiments in an ion trap, it should surprise no one here to learn that we use lasers to drive our transitions to gather our data um, and do these experiments. The most of our experiments are done with barium ions and I have a diagram of our relevant energy transitions here. Uh, we need to laser cool our ions to keep them in the trap. Our cooling transition is this 493 right here. Um, these are also the photons whose fluorescence we will collect to get the data on our experiments. Since, this collected, since these collected photons are our data, light collection is super important. Um, so a trapped ion is going to emit light in every direction, but you only get data from the photons that you collect going to your imaging system. So in most traps, there's just a lens placed here and you collect the light that passes through it, which typically is two to 3% of the solid angle. Um, higher collection efficiencies can occur with high numerical aperture lenses or other fancy systems of mirrors, such as a parabolic mirror. Uh, the advantage of a parabolic mirror is it will collimate light uh, that passes through its focus. 
Uh, we have a parabolic mirror trap, which has a 39% photon collection efficiency, which you can see here. So what we've done to create this is we've deformed this RF ring into a parabolic mirror shape made of a uh, highly polished aluminum. The upper end cap electrode was deformed into a ring to, um, so it won't block our optical access. And then the lower electrode 